Marianne Amache is a legendary figure in electronic music, sound installation, telematic performance, and media art, whose archive was acquired by the New York Library for the Performing Arts in 2020. For the last five years, Amy Simone and Bill Dietz have held a series of seminars and listening sessions publicly working through Amache's archive. Positioned as a generative rupture in our inherited notions of canonization, Simone and Dietz guide us through their approaches to the afterlife of this radical figure. The sort of premise of our of our presentation today and of so much of Amy and my work on Amche has been to somehow try to stake out some kind of ethical relationship to Amche and to, to the archive. Premature attempts to think about ways of indicating to characterize range of B with given A intervals, part of the quote unquote understanding ritual before finding approach. And there's something of the incompleteness uh, of that understanding before finding approach that we thought important to start with. So I'll just start reading from our intro. We have to start with her refusals because we still don't understand them. Marianne Amache's work cannot be experienced on a CD or on YouTube. Marianne Amache's work never happened in one-off festival slot performances. Marianne Amache's work is not music if you assume that music is a discrete live or recorded stretch of audio transmitted through the air to be listened to attentively or distractedly in a concert or domestic setting. As vivid as the experience of some aspects of her work mediated by those formats undoubtedly is for admirers around the world, she vehemently opposed those formats throughout her life. We can finally begin to understand her work as she herself conceived it. This move towards approaching her work on her own terms is not a matter of fidelity. Everyone is as free as ever to mishear and misunderstand, but one of intensity, of excitement. That is, as vivid as the second hand or compromised experiences of her work might be, but sounds, ideas, sensations, and relations have remained inaccessible until now are drastically strong and more urgent. The 100 plus boxes of materials soon to be processed in the library contain not just quote unquote great music, but an oeuvre that demanded an expansion of the very notion of music of art itself. An oeuvre that's still poised to demand a revision of both music and art history. Do we perceive the sound in the room, in our heads, at a great distance away? Or do we experience all three dimensions clearly at the same time? Is the sound barely audible, seeming to touch skin receptors only? The cochlea seems to feel untouched. Is the sound we perceive just enough stimuli to trigger patterns and melodies created within neural sensitivities, shaping our deepest responses? In the room, does the sound drift, float, fall like air? Does it make such a clear shape in the air that we seem to see it in front of our eyes? Is there no sound, no music in the room at all, but we continue to hear sound as our minds process after sound from music perceived minutes ago? Is the apparent sound volume larger than life? E.g., is it as powerful as a gigantic sounding house? Energy circulating through many rooms and floors? Some people say they feel their bodies grow out, expand with this sound. These descriptions refer to actual results, real effects of music I have made, not simply metaphors for possible experiences. In the full version of this preceding passage written in 1980, Amache cites specific works and occasions in which each of the listed effects was achieved. Her work as she envisioned it, however, may never have been fully realized in her lifetime. Large architecturally staged works in St. Paul, San Francisco, Krems, and Tokushima are among the precious few that she would recall with affection. But what even to call such works? Where to place these works? In light of her emphatic rejection of both museum-oriented installation formats and concert-oriented recital formats. How to even begin thinking about works that occurred as developing serial occasions across multiple sound joined rooms, filled not only with structure born and airborne sound, but with texts, videos, 3D projections, and props. 
So I'm hoping today that in tracing two particular moments of wrong listening, I'm hoping that I might somehow helpfully inflect our framing of what we understand the prospect of Amshay's challenge to listening to be. The first Amshay sounds I heard were the titular sound characters released on her 1999 Zodic CD. I was listening then on a CD boombox with the volume up high without any real idea of how this audio would and could have been used or installed. Roughly a year after I put on that Zodic CD in my little basement room, I was seeing and hearing her live in Berlin. There in Berlin, I was left beyond speechless after getting caught up in the, her works after sound. Her performance closed with a 20 or so minute long fade out. The fade was so gradual and my ears were so attuned to it. I remember tiptoeing up to one of the loudspeakers and placing my ear directly against the membrane as I was unable to discern whether the still present sound was in my head or being projected through the air. This vivid experience of just how much richer, more intense her installed work was, or rather how the installed and performed experience was a different experience altogether, was immeasurably experientially reinforced by the time I was lucky enough to spend in Amishay's company as a friend, assistant, and helper. The full text of the title of the work from which the Zodic excerpt comes is quote, a step into it, imagining 1,000 years, end quote, celebrating the millennium, Krems, 995 to 1995. First night, entering ancient rooms. Second night, the sound of things unheard, a multimedia narrative serialized in two feature-length productions, music sets and production design by Marian Amashe. So presented in this sort of 10th century church in Krems, Austria, gestures to both her ongoing Music for Sound Joint Room series, as well as her episodic mini sound series. More specifically to her conceptual framing of this work in this letter that she writes to Joe Eichinger, who is the curator of this festival. I am an experienced designer. In imagining 1001 years, we enter ancient rooms. I plan to simulate an ancient atmosphere character of the church, imagining far back into the silence of that time, before the big roar of the heat machine. I want these cold conditions to inspire me in creating a multidimensional aural architecture. I want them for the audience as well. I want them to be cold, to experience these ancient atmospheric conditions, to enter this time and its silence. The uh, care that Amy and I try to insist upon in approaching Amshay's work is not so much a gesture towards some unknown or unknowable real thing or real practice, but rather to something tangible, something that we know without a name, something already in us, which suggests something radically else, an ulterior literacy, something which Amshay's work ghost writes, that's her term, for and with us, into rapt awareness. At least one example that begin like so many for Amishé with an unrealized project. We start with the cover page from a 1992 concept summary for a string quartet with electronics commissioned by the Kronos Quartet. This tantalizing project persists in multitudinous dense fragments in the archive. This includes proposals, notated score pages, structure sketches and MIDI recordings and angry correspondence with Kronos management about when the piece would be delivered, which was never. But as is often the case with Amishé, titles and concepts multiply transform within any single project. This complete project can be thought of as an intelligence that can interact with this convergence with what Bill called this tangible in us, the interaction between sound for the, from the string quartet and recorded sound would create this virtual interaural effect, plus a second recorded sound or this intelligence would interact with it via interchange, displacement, or enhancement. And Amashe calls this an enhancer music. So this is not a piece at all. <laughs> It was in one sense, a research program, which systematically integrated the ensemble into an experiential working method led at every stage by the listener's music. 
But in another sense, it opened up those interaural phenomena in perhaps emphatically social terms. That is as a kind of virtual space that was at the same time also ineluctably embodied. So that as she put it, the composer, quartet and listener could meet and commingle. We see sort of sketches of names for interactive modes through which this kind of enhancer music as intelligence would engage interaural dynamics in virtual space. As Amache said in 2005 about her own work, I'll conclude by saying, quote, I just like learning more because I just don't understand this, end quote. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. I, I want to ask a question that specifically has to do with Amache as a writer. One of the, the most polished pieces of writing that, that appears in, in the selected writings is the short piece Anywhere City which was written in 1974 as a proposal for the NEA. Let me, let me go ahead and read it, just a short part of it. Since 1965, I've explored sound and the environment in terms of acoustical and architectural space, as well as the direct use of environmental sound, both in the composition of music for concert experience and in the creation of special sound environments for both interior and exterior spaces. My hope is that the split, which now exists between these two worlds, that of musical language and of environmental sound will one day be closed. My work is directed to this end, period, right? So this is a fascinating moment uh, because it's so clear and it's so programmatic. And it is true, she often is, is a crystalline, marvelously clear writer. But um, my two questions from this are, the first having to do with the content of this, to what extent did this remain a goal of her work? And then finally, the, the kind of like take a step back and respond critically to the form of this piece of writing. How do you weigh something like this, a, a written document that's written, as in the case of this one, a proposal for the NEA? There was a point in the last 20 years where I realized that a lot of my most interesting writing was going into grant applications. And uh, for me, that was also a point to like start working differently, <laughs> um, which is, I think, maybe not Amishay's approach, but my approach, um, which is just to say that um, that very important writing can, of course, happen in these kind of forms. It's such an interesting piece of writing because I think what it sort of narrates sort of most crisply is its backstory. It's like, this is why I have to do this project. This is why I have to work the way I do. And then when it comes to getting one's head around what the actual project would entail, things become sort of very fuzzy again, um, which I think is which I think is really interesting. So again, it's like you almost see the the project like resist its own realization even at the proposal stage. 